again, and it's a, sorry, let's get rid of that. Um, it, it's it, three months have passed so incredibly quickly since we met before. And we've got one more just coming in. So morning, Tony, good to have you on board as well. And so lovely to see some familiar faces from our previous forum, which was the first one, and welcome to some new faces as well. Delighted to see you. And uh, just before we really set off with the meeting, possibly it's a good idea for me to just lay out the first principles again of really what, why you are joining this and why we have set it up. That this is very much a forum for sharing ideas, for making recommendations on what's worked for you already in your organisation, possibly presenting case studies, uh, highlighting potholes, things that have not gone according to plan. Uh, items that didn't work and um, possibly some problem solving within the forum for that as well. Morning, Andrew. Good to see you. Morning. Um, Hi. Sorry I'm a bit late. No problem at all. And what this isn't is it is not a sales pitch and it is not political. It's probably one of the few times in history that this is genuinely an occasion that everybody can be involved, all organisations and all individuals. We all have this common goal. And the Chamber's role within this is very much to provide that space to uh, facilitate practicalities. It's now about getting this done, making it happen. And the, uh, one of the things that came out of the previous meeting uh, that was asked for at the time and a gathering of the information that was around uh, in that meeting is the Chamber now has a web page full of that information and links back to further information that were recommended by you and others from uh, last time's forum. So we're moving on a little bit with today's agenda. And I suppose to sum it up, it really is what is the price of a green conscience? What does it cost an organization? How do you get from a nebulous idea that we all need to do something sometime soonish to then putting that onto your own organization's agenda and getting commitment for it? And our agenda today um, will be coming up shortly. Lovely, thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, I will be handing over to Roger McCurley very shortly, who will then be chairing the meeting. And the items that we're going through today is um, a quick fire catch up around the group who has been able to do what or not since we've met before. And this is not a self-flagellation exercise, bearing in mind that there's still a good 50% of organisations out there who do not have a sustainable um, procurement strategy. And possibly the same 50% or possibly a different 50% do not have a carbon reduction strategy in place. So for anyone that has nothing in place, this is nothing to be ashamed of, please. We all have to start. And it's that start, that launching the first foot forward that is possibly the most difficult piece of all. Um, and that's where we can help and share information, help each other, look at strategies that have worked and share those from different organizations to uh, one another. But also, once you've got commitment, and sometimes, again, there can be some in organisations that have the commitment there ready, but it's that financial commitment. On many occasions, we've seen with um, initiatives in the past that these can come to a grinding halt very quickly as soon as it gets to the financial department. Because how do you take a concept, a commitment such as this, and turn it into something that has a financial benefit for an organization as well. And that's something I hope we'll have the opportunity to share this morning. Um, and having gained that commitment, it's how do you know you've achieved something, anything, nothing? Looking at that baseline measurement, and again, open to discussion on how you're doing that at the moment. And we hope that this will all be very interactive, but also there'll be an opportunity for a, a question uh, and answer breakout sessions or session together at the end. So again, thank you very much all for attending. And I'd now like to introduce Roger McCurley, who's from EBM, who is uh, the Chamber's green guru, I think is the way to describe him at the moment. Roger has a very broad knowledge in many sustainability areas. And I know, is one of the best people I know that has this uh, overview that will be able to help all of us moving along uh, towards our route along this. So, Roger, over to you. 
<laughs> Thanks, Dawn. I think green guru is a terrifying expression. Please don't call me that. Um, <laughs> I, I remember not long ago um, turning up to a meeting um, in a four by four diesel car with four environmental lawyers and wondering why they were looking at me in a very strange way. Um, so the car had to go. But um, yeah, I, I, I think gurus are stretching. I think that the, the point is that um, this is a journey that everybody's on, whether they want to be on it or not. And therefore, you need to maximise it, really. And, and this is one of those rare times in anybody's business experience, I think, of um, where sharing information is more important than um, confidentiality and competitiveness. This is this is too important at the moment. You see, many of you might have read this morning that the, the, uh, the UK Met Office is saying that uh, we will go above 1.5 degrees above um, the Industrial Revolution uh, setting in the next uh, five years, which is further ahead than everybody had hoped. So the the, uh, the impact on the climate is undeniable and, and isn't going away. But the reality is, I think um, uh, a lot of businesses need to understand what's in it for them, basically. And and, and, and I guess, you know, acknowledging Linda's uh, presence on here as well, it's not just business, it's about the, the public sector as well. And the expression I've used and, and got into trouble a couple of times from environmentalists is saying that the, uh, the race to net zero is anything but it's a brisk walk. And when you've got um, China and India saying that it's going to be 60 and 70 before they get to net zero, I think it's a little difficult to expect businesses, especially SMEs, to revolutionise how they do things. So we, we look at it certainly much as, a, as a, a brisk walk. And we being the Environmental Business Network, which is an organisation I set up in 2019, launched it to a great fanfare and then put, um, shut it down during lockdown while I, I went away and learned a lot more about um, environmental challenges we face and the opportunities of which there are many. And I think one of the things that we should focus on is very much where is the opportunity in this space? Because it's more motivational, quite frankly, than um, being concerned and, and wringing our hands about the state of the climate. So I think there are plenty of opportunities out there for businesses. So I set the EBN up with a view to enabling all types of businesses to come together under one roof and there is a free membership level um, which is on the website um, and the idea is that we learn share and connect and, and, and really make a difference and, and we're, we're going great guns from that point of view so um, and, and um, but we're very very much focused on the idea of saying let's look at the business opportunities and the expression I use for the EBN is that the, the climate crisis is the backcloth to our stage but the play itself, if you like, is about where is the business opportunity for organisations to make a difference, uh, and, 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 and that is crucially important. You can't be greenwashing in this front, but also to learn how you can actually benefit from it. So, so that's what I do. I've also got a consultancy called XEDSG, which is designed to help businesses um, go from that, that start point of where people say, I just don't understand this. What the hell do I do? What is ESG? Um, which is in environmental social governance, and we can return to that later if people want to, through to that end of thinking, okay, I'm on a journey, I'm trying to do something about it, and then how do I turn it into a commercial marketing proposition? Uh, so that's why I do. So Dawn, I think you, you wanted everybody just to do a quick fire, hi, who are they, and, and um, what they do. So um, I'm now just seeing on, a, on a, a list, so lead off whoever wants to go first. I've got where I'm looking. I've got Anne is the, the top person. So Anne, maybe if you would, but you're on mute. I'm not on mute anymore. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm Anne Pearson, and I'm the director of property at Seven Oaks School. And I think it's quite interesting for us to be part of this group. You know, we feel very much part of the community. Um, we've got sustainability as a core strategy for us for the next 10 years as we work up towards 2032, which is 600 years, 600th anniversary of the school. We've got three strands and two of them are just very quickly. One is about the education. Of course, most students know more about it than we do and are very much ahead of the game. One is about what we're doing as a school in terms of our operations, in terms of our recycling, in terms of what we're doing actually um, on a day-to-day -day basis but and my main um, strategy as director of property is what we're doing to improve sustainability across the site now as you may or may not know we've got 82 buildings some of which are listed some of which are brand new a couple of them are carbon net zero already 
um, but we have just instructed a company to do a sustainability audit across the whole site, which starts off by looking at a sort of energy assessment. All of our boiler and all of our plant is very separate within each building. We don't have any district heating. Um, so they're going to do that piece of work and then look at what we can do across the site in terms of quick wins, but also in terms of the longer strategy, because this is a very expensive business for us. We're also looking at sort of at the same time in parallel with that we're looking at we have Johnson's boarding house which is a 1920s 1910 house um, boarding house which has a hundred year old boiler in it and we're looking at what we replace it with and that's not as straightforward as you think because in order to replace it it's an oil fuel boiler in order to replace it with um uh, air source or electricity, you need to do the work across the whole building in terms of looking at the insulation, looking at the windows before you can think about an air source heat pump, for example, because otherwise it just won't be sufficient for a building of that size for 60 borders. So we're looking at that and we're also looking at a, a 1990s staff accommodation property, which is on the cartilage of the site, which is and what we can do to improve the, to make it more sustainable and to improve the condition of that house as well. So we're kind of looking at lots of different things, um, but the sustainability audit, which is a big piece of work to say, what can we do across the site to, um, to become, to work towards carbon net zero in an affordable and cost-effective way? That's more than 30 seconds, but will it do as a starter? Very good, very good. Um, I'll, I'll come back to that Johnson's thing later on, if I may. Yes, of um, course. Cool. Yeah, okay. Um, again, people, I, I can only see a, a limited amount on this, so uh, just somebody else fire off. Shall, I, shall I go? Shall I go, Roger? Yeah, please, please. Hi, uh, I'm Andrew Raby. I'm senior partner of Backray Williams Solicitors. We have several offices, but we have one in uh, the town in Seven Oaks in Pembroke Road, which we opened in October 2018. Uh, I have an interest in this area, although I'm sort of, I suppose, new to it in a sense. Um, but I had the benefit of a uh, half an hour or so coffee with Roger back in. Um, January, uh, which is very kind of him to give up his time just to chat to, to me about this. And I've now started to talk to my partners about this as a sort of a, a topic slash project for our firm um, for a number of reasons. Uh, but it's interesting how one, one of the positives of COVID and the lockdown is as, as a firm, uh, we have very much moved towards being paper light in virtually all the departments um, and indeed uh, paper free in a number of them as well whereas normally most people would know that as lawyers we we love our paper we love having filing cabinets full of files and things like that but um that has really changed so that, that's an interesting thing which was kind of forced upon us in a sense but but has been a benefit um but also more generally for us as a business we are noticing that when we're being asked to tender for certain pieces of work for certain organizations there is an element of, uh, for want of a better word, I suppose, sustainability in in the in the tender paperwork. You know, we are asked to, uh, in some uh, cases, give details of what our policies are, what are we doing, and we had a trainee open evening uh, week before last, um, where we had thirty odd potential trainees who may apply to our firm coming for an open evening in one of our offices in Bromley. And it was interesting how uh, quite a few of them asked questions about what, you know, what do we do as a business in terms of sustainability, what our policies are, et cetera, et cetera. So there's an element here where we are, we want to do something about this. And yes, we do see opportunities. Um, but I think there's also an element where as a business, we're, we're going to be pressured into making sure we do something about this and we can't just uh, greenwash it. Is that the right word, uh, Roger? Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, because we'll be found out. So I think we're in a position where, as a business, we, uh, me and my partners, and lots of people in the business have, you know, talked to us about it. And we got got champions around different firms wanting to make sure things are being, you know, uh, recycling and stuff like that. Where where people want to do it for, if you like, the the sort of the right reason. It's the right thing to do. Uh, but at the same time, there's a business there's business pressures coming in as well. So that's kind of us really. Brilliant. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Anybody else? 
Okay, I'm uh, sorry, I'm a bit like Andrew, but new to this, so I was just interested to come along and see uh, what you were discussing. I'm Jay from Hospices of Hope, and I'm uh, the fundraising executive there. Um, we have a chain of charity shops, and about 16 of them dotted around, sort of 10, a couple in Scotland, um, and we've noticed sort of things are sort of changing with regards to our shops and stuff and the way stuff's being sold uh, and the way we're sort of recycling stuff and that using different formats and things nowadays. And we've been noticing that sort of even like the way Marks and Spencers are doing things now, it was talked about yesterday, they're sort of renting out clothes and stuff now, which is a new thing for them. So um, we sort of sort of I thought it'd be interested to see what people are doing within their uh sort of work field and uh, and see what things we could be doing going forward um yeah so i was just interested so yeah thank you for letting me be part of it yeah interesting thanks joe well, I'd, I'd like to come back to that because it, it, it's it is very interesting here that you so you've got um third sector public sector and commercial organizations maybe different drivers that are coming on it but everybody has got a driver which i think is really interesting on that front so Thanks for that, Joe. We'll return to that, especially the clothes, but I think there's a big opportunity on the, um, the circular economy for you in that space. Thank you. I don't mind going there, if you're... Please. Okay, so from Seven Oaks Town Council, since our last meeting, we've appointed a part-time climate change project officer. They, He's put together um, an action plan which is being reviewed monthly and moving forward on the actions and coordinating all staff on that. We've also created a survey for the local community, which is to establish a baseline. We've had about um, 100 responses to date and our aim target is for 3000. So there's a bit of work to do there. We're currently obtaining quotes to have all our buildings um, having a sustainable audit carried out and also assessing our baseline carbon um, number so that we can review this again annually firstly to see what carbon savings we've done as a, a council and a community and also you know whether that translates into any financial savings too. Excellent. Yeah, I, I think I have to say, uh, Linda, when we did um, dawn the, the one down at um, Baton Ball, was it last summer that I was um, um, just hugely impressed? I, th I think I wasn't sure whether they were, it was the district council or town council, but in both cases, I think there's some really, really good stuff going on and some good leadership being shown by you guys and also other public sector organisations. That um, I suppose my question and thought is, how do the businesses of the town tap into what is clearly a growing knowledge pool that you, you guys have got? And um, I think that'll be something to explore as well. Yeah. I mean, I think our main aim is not to duplicate anything, but to link with the chamber, hence being here today and uh, with the district council. So it's all coordinated, really. Mm. Yeah, cool. OK. Rachel, go on. Hello. So, yeah, I'm Rachel. I'm practice manager at Leverett's, which is a barrister solicitor. Uh, practice in Seven Oaks, and I'm here to show Roger that I'm willing to <laughs> change our ways. Um, I'm really here to glean from everybody else because I know that we need to improve our sustainability, but we don't really know where to start making those changes. So I'm uh, busy making notes and we'll see where we go. Yeah, good. I mean, I think, you know, as I've said, that, that kind of um, brisk walk rather than race is the thing is uh, my message to everybody is not to panic obviously we've got to do things about it but um getting started is the critical thing and once you start it, it's much easier to move forward from that point of view but it is that sort of where do i begin but maybe that's something on the writing a sustainability action plan dawn that we could we could explore a little bit is is where do you start to do that sort of thing okay anybody else Morning, Roger. Um, I'm Andy Horner. I don't know if my camera's uh, working at the moment. Um, uh, I, I not at the moment, but don't worry, Andy. Yeah, I was frozen before. Um, anyway, um, I'm the bursar at uh, Walthamstow Hall uh, in uh, in Seven Oaks, um, and rather like uh, Anne uh, at uh, Seven Oaks School, um, we are at the beginning of the uh, the journey here. We are uh, looking to do an audit. Um, we have some ideas of uh, how we want to or where we think we need to go. 
So for instance, we are three quarters of the way through uh, changing all our light bulbs to LED as a, uh, you know, sort of the initial quick win. Uh, we've already got some um, PV solar panels. Uh, we're looking to uh, expand those. And then in my, in my own way, I'm hoping that we'll be able to put in a network of uh, charging points for um, electric vehicles for staff. We already have probably three or four staff who have asked uh, if they can charge uh, uh, on site. Um, and we were looking for um, electric minibuses to replace the uh, the diesel minibuses that we, we've got. But unfortunately, uh, there's very few on the market. And there's not much uh, out there at the moment. So that's going to have to uh, to wait. Um, once we've done the audit, it will uh, it'll help us. Um, we recent, I say recently, a couple of years ago, changed um our heating system um from 1950s vintage um boilers uh to new gas boilers um so they've probably got 25 years life uh, in them before we need to uh change change them at the same time we um re uh piped the school so rather than using the old sort of three inch uh, pipes for the hot water, which used to heat the whole of the uh, the building, whether you had your radiator on or off. Uh, we've now gone for uh, much more modern radiators uh, and uh, piping um, and control systems to try and uh, manage the uh, the heat. But I think, uh, as Anna sort of uh, indicated, we we also have Victorian to um, uh, only a couple of years old uh, buildings. Um, and heat loss uh, in the main building is the um, is probably one of the main uh, issues that I can see being a problem um, um, in the fact that it's uh, single brick in certain areas and uh, certainly single pane glass uh, throughout the uh, the main uh, the main building. And whilst we are not listed, um, you know we need to uh, do anything sensibly uh, and sensitively um, to any changes. Uh, the other area that I think that we um, are likely to struggle, um, unlike some local schools, uh, will be the the element of uh, uh, the pupils coming to school. Unlike uh, state schools where the catchment area is quite often uh, a lot closer, um, you know, we have people coming down from uh, from Bromley, uh, from Tunbridge Wells, um, you know, uh, coming into uh, to school. Uh, and whilst we use minibuses and uh, and encourage people to use the train, um, there's still a lot that get driven. Uh, so it's those green miles that we need to try and um, you know, uh, change uh, people's habits uh, if we can. But there again, if you're in a small village with limited um, uh, bus uh, routes, it's going to be very difficult and they're probably going to still continue to drive to uh, school. Uh, so it's it's interesting and I'm, uh, uh, I'm, I'm glad that um, you know everybody's got the same uh, issues. I don't think, uh, um, you know, we're all alone. Uh, we've all got very similar uh, issues. Uh, and I think this will be uh, uh, a useful forum. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Andy. Um, Martin, you're to Andy's left on my screen. So why don't you, you go? Thanks, Roger. Uh, yes. Good morning, everyone. My name is Martin White, and my company is called GreenBusinessHub.eco. Um, and we are a platform, um, a, a digital platform that works with businesses and organizations specifically in the sustainability space. And our raison d'etre really is all about connecting those businesses and organizations for the purpose of, of doing green business or more sustainable business. So we work with directly with Kent County Council. Uh, we promote all of their green grant funding initiatives like Low Case and Kent Revs. They've just launched um, a new green recovery voucher scheme that I'm sure some of you are aware of, which we'll be promoting shortly as well. Uh, we'll also be exhibiting within the Low Carbon Kent Zone at Business Vision Live tomorrow. So uh, do pop along to that if you have a chance. You'll find out all, all about um, support and advice and help available in the, in the sustainability space. Um, we've also just started working last week with East Kent College, funnily enough, um, some colleges and schools in the in the room today uh, with a view to helping them promote um, a green manufacturing and engineering program that they have within the college um, and Mid Kent College, for example, have a similar program for construction, um, but also helping um, them as well as other businesses and organizations increasingly 
to green their supply chain. I think for me, that is the, the key thing there. And, and what Andrew said, I think was very pertinent. And I think that's that's going to become the norm for most uh, businesses, certainly, and, and, and public sector organisations in the very near future that, um, you know, when you're um, submitting tenders, for example, or when you're writing tender requests, there is going to be an overt reference to you know, what are your, your net zero credentials as a business tendering for my business, as it were. And, and we've already seen that in the public sector with central government contracts, anything over the value of five million pounds now has to be supported by a net zero action plan on, 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 on the part of that particular business. And I think that's going to filter down more and more to local authority level and to to private sector businesses as well, because clearly, you know, everybody needs to be doing uh, working towards that same goal if it's ultimately going to work so um so yeah we're about kind of promoting and, and and connecting and bringing together businesses in that space for the purpose of doing business ultimately cool great excellent um who else hasn't gone yet so far sorry i'm struggling with my screen here to see everybody i think we've still got tony clayton and oliver Pemi and uh, myself okay so who wants to go Did you say T um, Tony? Go on, fire yeah, away. I'll unmute before I try. Uh, I'm here on behalf of the Seven Oaks Climate Action Network, which kicked off at the Methodist Church um, in, in the drive back in November, and several chamber members and Dawn came to it. And what we're trying to do is develop material where people who just part of the community in Seven Oaks, not necessarily businesses, can share information on how to uh, do the right thing for themselves and for So, I mean, what we would like to be able to do, and, and two of the members have started it, is producing little, little podcasts and summaries of what you can do and what Net Zero means for you, because there's still a big education job to do out there in the community. I was, I was quite impressed by um, what Anne and Lee were doing with their schools, because they have done probably what, or they are doing, what is probably the biggest problem for a lot of people who live in Seven Oaks, how to retrofit zero carbon or reduce carbon into existing houses. And there are a lot of them around Seven Oaks. The majority of the houses we're going to be living in in 2050 have already been built. And I don't think um, you know, the government act, not all the sort of public sector um, initiatives recognise that. So um, any, any stuff that you generate that can be shared we would be very interested in promoting and sharing. Um, on my on on my other capacity, I'm, this is not as a sorry. I'll turn this off for a minute. It's totally frozen, or is it just me? No, I'm just oh, sparing, you my, sparing you my grandfather clock. That's all. Oh, sorry. I wonder what that was going. <laughs> Well, it was a rather pleasant noise, actually. Well, one of the problems of working from home. Yeah. But, Sounded um, like a my, knockout. <laughs> <laughs> so in, my, in my other capacity, I'm, I'm also an economics consultant. And I like, like quite a lot of small businesses in Seven Oaks who I suspect are not part of the chamber. A lot of individual professional businesses. Um, the way I work has changed radically since 2019. Um, I used to go out and visit clients and visit interviewees and you know, visit people I was trying to figure out what you know, how to help. I now do the whole thing on Zoom and I suspect I will never again take a plane trip as part of my business and that is probably the biggest contribution I can make to reducing carbon and my clients expect that now. I'm working, I've been doing work for the United Nations and for the OECD and they do not expect any more to play for to, to, to plane trips or travel. Um, and so that has made a big difference to my carbon footprint. Yeah. And, I suspect, and, and, and that means, you know, you actually need to work differently. And I suspect you know, for a lot, quite a lot of people, it means um, you know, local networking is quite important. If, you, if you're not actually getting out to, to meet people, local business network is really important. And that itself helps individual professional business people change the way they work. 
Indeed, absolutely. It's um, there's an interesting thing that there was um, something that there's um, a publication called ED E D E I, which is worth signing up to if you want to just get a general education in uh, what's going on. It tends to focus on corporates, but they were uh, one of their headlines today said that somewhere in the region of sixty to seventy percent of corporate organisations, despite committing to net zero and having an in-depth um, program and do not expect their employees to stop flying to meetings, which is really, it seems very, very counterintuitive to, yeah. to them having a, a green agenda. So, but one of the things I think we'll find on this whole journey is that, um, as the accountants would say, every debit has a credit. So the argument around EV vehicles uh, on the one hand, electric vehicles on the one hand is, is people argue about the damage done by um, um mining for for the minerals that go into them and then what you do with them the batteries at end of life so nothing is simple in this 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 world and and that's one of the things the takeaway i'd suggest is that um to an extent is don't worry about that they just crack on and do something because there, nothing's proven yet from that point of view that um that there is one set way to do that but um so who else we've got dawn and who else did you say sorry there was one other person was there Aloha Penny, if you're available, can't see, yeah. Hi, um, good morning. My name is Aloha Penny and I'm from Nigeria. Uh, okay, so I just stumbled on this um, forum on Eventbrite and I said to join. And um, basically, I own a fashion business here in Nigeria and I've been looking to make our processes more sustainable. And so I decided to look for something where I could learn more on how to make my business more sustainable. What we're currently doing is we um, make sure, and when we cut clothes, we have fabric scraps everywhere, and there are so many scraps that get disposed every now and then. And I just thought, this fab, um, these scraps don't decompose, and how do we find a way to, you know, make this useful? So what we what we are currently doing is we are putting those scraps together and finding a way to do some sort of Patchwork, and we're clothing needy kids in the environment with them. So we put this craft together and make something useful for kids in the environment. We're also looking at how to change our packaging from using nylons and plastics and using more sustainable processes. We still haven't figured all of that out yet, but we're still in the process. Um, there's also uh, the another part of the business that is looking into creating fabric from recycled plastics. So it's still a very small business and I'm just starting out. I just wanted to learn more and that's why I'm here. Thank you very much. Cool, brilliant. I, I think those issues around packaging and recycling of plastic are huge issues and maybe something we can touch on a little bit on the circular economy because um, uh, there's, there's some great opportunities in that. But, but um, and I certainly think everybody gets frustrated these days. Everybody is much more conscious of single-use plastic and certainly the packaging. Um, and uh, I see by or certainly the amount of stuff that arrives on vans at our house uh, for our eldest daughter is wrapped in packaging that you just sit there thinking, what on earth is this all about? From So th that packaging thing is really interesting. Uh, thanks for that. So Dawn, uh, um, last but absolutely not least. OK, thank you. Um, I suppose representing the smaller employer today, um, Chamber Office has a sort of 1.3 full time equivalent. Um, through pandemic and similar to what Andrew was discussing a little earlier on describing, um, we are virtually a paperless office. We have condensed 110 years of supporting business into half a filing cabinet. Everything else is now electronically filed. Um, we uh, rent our office, so it would be very easy to say we have no responsibility whatsoever. Um, but that would be wrong. We have upward pressure we can put on landlord, Linda. Uh, um, but again, it would be then be very easy to say, no responsibility, done what we can. But as again has been alluded to a number of times, it's that networking out there, finding out what other people are doing, what have we not thought about that we could work with. And um, the area I would like to spend more time on now where I can influence something is looking at that supply chain because that is something that is still there and will continue to be there. How uh, much am I interrogating that supply chain and what cost, what benefit does it have for doing that? Thank you, Roger. Yeah, very good, very good. Um, any 
did anybody want to jump in just there on any concluding points on that before we kind of move on or any observations? Okay, good. There's a few things that have come out of there that I think um, are interesting, not, not least the structure of this group in that we have people representing different marketplaces, uh, some of which the pressures may seem um, very different, but they all come back to that same common denominator. Um, we've looked at supply chain a lot, and that either as part of a supply chain to a large corporate or indeed our own supply chain, I think is an important element to look at. Um, travel, um, key issue, not gonna go away. What do we do to fix it? The, the whole retrofit of the, the housing stock uh, of the UK is, is um, something that's probably beyond our capability in this, or, um, this group. But um, there's a guy I know who used to be the director general of um, Bayes, which is the uh, business energy industrial strategy group for the UK government. And he's, he's now back in a, a major consultancy. And it was interesting talking to him. He said that he was, wasn't worried about the electric vehicle market because in the end, the, the, the market forces will dictate that that works. Albeit, as, as was mentioned, um, I think by Andy, I uh, can't get an electric um, minibuses, that the supply chain isn't great. But his view on that was that in the end, that marketplace will sort itself out and the, the economics of it will work. What he said was keeping him awake at night was um, how to retrofit 40 million houses in the UK, which um, is a major, major challenge and, and probably one of the biggest things that is going to make a massive difference now. What we can do about it here is, is probably not within the scope of this discussion, but I think taking, Tony, what you said, I think there's an important part to try and connect what the business community in the, the chamber is doing with the people of Seven Oaks. And, and certainly it would be helpful, I guess, Dawn, and, and forgive me if I'm speaking out of turn here, to have more people, regardless of whether they're um, chamber members or not, contributing to this and to help. Linda get to that point of um, 3,000 um, opinions as opposed to 100. So I think the more we can share this journey, the better really. And then the accumulated knowledge is absolutely critical because just even out of these, these quick fire rounds, I think there's a few things that have come out to me that are, that are really worth looking at. Um, Dawn, you, 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 the, the agenda then moves on to writing sustainability action plan. Um, I, I mean, it's a fairly broad, broad expression that <laughs> Um, and, and some people have already said they've started. To an extent, we've kind of covered that. Could, could I um, mix and merge a little bit of these um, the, the agenda items? Because one of the things I'd like to, to get to is finding out from people on, on the next bit of gaining commitment, what are the strategies for getting buy-in? I don't want to be negative, but I'd also just like to hear what people have got to say. What are the barriers that they need to overcome to, to getting a sustainability strategy in place if that's okay i'd just like people to chirp in and, and give some views on that so what, what are the barriers that people are encountering encountering somebody lead off for me uh well very briefly uh i don't see it this is not a um, a fixed barrier it's more like one of those car park barriers that goes up and down as your car goes in and out in our firm but uh one thing i'm in the process of doing is just um persuading my partners that we need to put together a proper plan and commitment to this, which will inevitably involve some funding. And as our new financial year has already started in, on 1st April, um, and at the moment there's no budget for it in that budget because that budget was agreed kind of February time, <laughs> shall we say. Um, so that there's a bit of a barrier there, but it's not, I'm pleased to say in my case, it's it's not an unwillingness to do it or I'm not hitting a barrier saying, no, we can't do it. We just need to think about who's going to do it, who's going to lead it, how we're going to do it and, you know, what we're going to throw at it or what can we do, do with it financially, even though there's lots of things we can do which don't have a big financial cost, possibly no cost at all. But, but, but you know, there's always money as a bit of a barrier there, Roger. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. L Linda, uh, you, you had a comment. Yeah, I think our, our initial problem is that there's a lot of people talking about it. I could sit on forums all day from different organisations about this. And there's a lot of public talking about it, saying it's sort of, but trying to get this baseline established, trying to just ask people to participate in a very easy way of a simple questionnaire has been very difficult. And one of the the constant things we have as a local authority is we're asked for proof of what we've done and what difference it's made and if we don't have a baseline it's very hard then later to, we we are already doing a lot but to prove that 
you have either improved your carbon level or or other things as well and i think that would be the same for businesses that you can list things but it, you need to demonstrate if you've got shareholders or other people you know how what difference has that made so our, our biggest problem um is not what we are setting out to do in our action plan but is to get the community buy-in which is really quite surprising given how many people are talking about it yeah do, do, do you think i mean sort of somewhat despairing a little bit but do, do you think it's just inertia amongst the community that yeah. people not care that much well i think it's saying and doing is the difference and mm. it's quite interesting in some of the results and people say i go on holiday six times a year are you going to change that probably not you know <laughs> um so it's to say the the saying it um it can be in a room with many people who are all talking about how important it is but those people still aren't willing to you know sign a simple questionnaire so yeah okay and i'm conscious there's a lot of hands up now but just just one thought actually linda that is worth looking at that um uh, <clears throat> some of you may know i'm um or was involved with seven oaks rugby club as the director of rugby and one of the issues that we are looking at as a club is how and where do we try and influence sustainability amongst our members of which there are nearly two and a half thousand and i'm just wondering whether there's something in there from a the, the town council point of view linda of working with the sports clubs because yeah. they have that, those audiences and and could we push something out to all of the clubs um saying look mm. guys we need your help let's at least do some sort of uh, help us with the benchmarking thing and, and actually yeah. use the clubs as a channel to market to be fair roger we have done it to all clubs and residents associations throughout the town and still, you know, at sitting at 100, which is just right. Fun. Okay. You can do well, I'll, I'll it. certainly talk keep, to the. We'll um, keep doing it. Yeah. Yeah. I'll talk to the rugby club and see what their, their thoughts are. Um, I think, um, sorry, just in, in order, was it, I think, Anne, you wanted to say that. I will come back to you, Tony, but I think Martin wants to say something as well. So, Anne, fire off first, if you would. Okay, so I think for us, we do have the, um, we're very fortunate to have the enthusiasm of youth on our side. And I think within the student body, there is a lot of support for our initiatives. However, students have times when they can devote to this and then they have exam times and the pressure of exams is very different. And what where, and then they move on and then other students come along and teachers who are in essence, a lot of them are really supportive, but they need to get their job done. And so I think for us, it's trying to embed our initiatives so that they really are sustainable and that we can sustain them. And that's that's actually a bigger problem than it sounds. Um, so that's one issue the, because our population, student population is transient. The other one is just simply cost because with it's fine our, our latest boarding house is um carbon net zero but all of those old buildings those listed buildings where we're tied in by planning restrictions or conservation restrictions as a listed building and just the cost of going through all of our buildings one by one and doing this piece of work is massive absolutely yeah. massive yeah and we have also done the LED work and, and changing our lights, most of them, not all of them, but to LED. It's a big a project which we've you know had done over many years, but it costs. And it's just trying to balance that with the, you know, the needs of teaching and learning of the school, et cetera, et cetera. A, a question to, to both you and, and, and Andy. Are you seeing any um, difference in, in kind of parental um, questions about whether they should send their children to your schools or not? based on your environmental credentials, as it were? Are you getting asked those things? Like Andrew said about it's featuring in business tenders. Is it happening with parents? I think it's a bonus, but I think from our experience, it's all about the quality of teaching and learning for our students is yeah. number one. And the environment. So you could say the environment in which they will be studying, that's important. And so therefore that sort of indirectly impacts on the environment and sustainability. But at the end of the day, they need to know that their children are going to get a rounded education. OK, um, Martin. Yeah, thanks. I just want to pick up on something that Andrew said, because obviously, um, you know, you guys in, in your firm are very much at the start of your journey. It always amazes me how under the radar all these kind of support initiatives and grant programs are um, in the marketplace. So there is one that's tailor-made for you 
um, Andrew, which is the green recovery voucher scheme that I mentioned earlier. So that will enable you to actually access uh, £1,500 worth of a specialist consultant's time to come into your business and actually help you start the process of creating a roadmap to net zero, for example. So do, do have a look at that. I think it's the third or fourth discussion down on our community page on our, our website, greenbusinesshub.eco. But I think the key message there is resource, going back to your original question, Roger, resource is, is clearly a massive issue for, for so many businesses needing to kickstart this process, whether that's skills, uh, time, financial resource, um, you know, clearly, you know, resource um, is, is, is a big issue. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, and and uh, Tony, sorry for keeping you waiting. No, just two two quick things. I mean, I, my experience in in sort of strategic marketing is that the best thing to get people on board and to raise awareness is nice, short, sharp case studies, and they don't have to be um, you know, super best practice. They don't have to be, um, you know, state of the art. Just what somebody around the corner did is it's a really good way of engaging people. So I mean, if, if some of the school has actually done this on some buildings um, and you could write it up on one side of A4 with some pictures, it would, it would have real traction. And the you know, same for anybody else in, in, in the room, really. Very short, sharp, simple cases of how we made progress. This does actually get attention much more than the numbers or the doom doom laden forecasts and all the rest of it this is what we did and this is how we made a difference um, um i've helped on, on the sort of baseline point linda's absolutely right um i've helped the town team design their survey for households um which we obviously need to get more take up on them right if we I would be amazed if you can't get that done through schools and sports clubs and churches and residents associations uh, because those organisations and some notes really work well. But we're really fortunate to have them all. Um, but I'd be happy to help the Chamber design one for business. Just, I mean, this is from my background as Director of Economics at the Statistics Office. I know how these things are done. Um, so I'm you know, happy to just chip in for that. Put me down. Thank you very much for that, Tony. I think that could be very useful. Yeah, I, th I think just listening to what people say, I mean, the, 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 the barriers are, as we'd expect, um, financial, well, resource-based, whether it be human or financial, is probably the biggest, um, and then an attitudinal one, I think, maybe from, from Linda's point of view. But I suppose, it, it, yeah, we, we could get down on that. The only thing I'd say on this is just to, to spur you on, to make you think, <laughs> don't despair, is if you cast your minds back to pre-pandemic, where was your organization at that particular juncture on this journey versus where you are now? And that's literally two years. And, and one of the, the um, or two and a half years, uh, whatever it may be. But one of the biggest things that, that um, I've noticed, and, and forgive me just telling the show in this story, is that the, um, in, in January 2020, BlackRock, who were the largest um, financial investment house with $8 trillion under management, made a conscious decision, and, and they get criticised for this, by the way. I'm not, I'm not an apologist for BlackRock, but they control a hell of a lot of money. BlackRock's um, CEO made a decision to say in a, in a letter that he writes every year to their, their um, invested companies that over a period of time, and I go back to this brisk walk, not race, they were going to um, disinvest in, in fossil fuels and start to look at sustainability um, funding. And what they said was, if the CEOs in, in our organisations don't start and begin their journey towards a, a net zero transition, they will be replaced at some particular stage. And nobody really believed them. But last summer, they replaced 90 CEOs in their portfolio um, of people who weren't actually doing what they said they were going to do. So now BlackRock with $8 trillion is a, is a gazillion miles away from this forum here, except it isn't in that, that chain, the, the domino effect that starts with big finance is permeating its way down through the system. And um, one of the things that we've talked about, maybe it's worth looking at, is supply chain. And most organisations 
in one way or another in the supply chain of a large um, organizations, whether it be financial institutions or corporates. And, and that pressure to change is definitely coming down the track. It just hasn't yet permeated down maybe as far as, as um, the SME space, but it is definitely coming. But the positive on that is that organized, corporate organizations particularly are starting to say, as, as Andrew highlighted in their tender, show us what you're doing and you will get a head start and there is a competitive advantage to be had from that point of view. So I think that the, one of the ways, the best ways to see this is to look back and, and maybe outside of this meeting, just reflect where your organization was two years ago. And, and I think you'll be amazed at how far, maybe three years ago, how far you've actually come from that point of view. Then um, future gaze that and look forward and think what it'll look like in a little bit uh, time moving forward there. So I think there's plenty to be optimistic about from that point of view, despite the obvious barriers. Um, okay, th thanks for that. Um, can, I, can I just ask a, a, a question which is related around getting started on this and, and baselines and this? How many organizations, how many people here have come across the concept of ESG in, in their business? Maybe just hands or something like that would be useful. But and, and does everybody know what ESG is? And as I say, environmental social governance. Does anybody has that cropped up much? So yes, Andrew. I haven't heard it in that terminology. I understand what it is, but not not I haven't used heard it expressed like that. Right, okay. Um, okay, so the, the reason I say this, I think this ESG is, um, and it, it, Dawn, am I okay just to share a few thoughts on this for a second? I'm conscious of straying off agendas and things, but I think ESG is really, really important and probably to everybody on this, this call in one way, shape or form. So ESG stands for environment, so environmental, social and governance, and it's, it's um, uh, a pattern of, of behaviours that increasingly organisations with money and we all need money out of, the, out of the system somewhere, are saying we need to see improved ESG behaviour. And the EBIT translates into the whole net zero race and circular economy and recycling and, and pollution and so on and so forth. The S is very much predicated on our so business social behaviour and what it actually does and doesn't do with its own communities. Um, and that can be anything from um, being very committed to avoiding modern slavery to, to how they're working with charities and organisations. And, and governance is, is probably fairly obvious. It's about how they measure. I would argue that it should be E plus S over G if you're going to be um, pedantic about it. But ESG is really making a is, is bigger and bigger impact at, at larger business and larger financial institution level. And I would certainly advocate that everybody here looks into ESG and learns as much about it as possible because it will have an impact in some way shape or form and, and if I may Jay just to take your area um, as, as a, a third sector organization I, I touched on the circular economy and that is part of the E of environmental attached to ESG and, and I would say that your opportunity to promote reuse of clothing for example and reuse through through your shops is actually bigger than you might realize and the opportunity to be able to go out there and actually promote that people can get quality clothing and quality materials through the, the Ospreys Hope shops is, is something that is worth focusing on because, going back to that from Tony as an individual point of view, and, and is I as a consumer go into, <coughs> excuse me, um, a Hospice of Hope shop and I buy, I don't know, some clothing and, and some other material, I'm immediately making my own personal contribution towards um, to, to environmental sustainability because I'm not ordering stuff from Primark um, further down that chain where we know that people are working at slave labour rates. So there is a connectivity around ESG in, in absolutely everything. And I think that also will apply um, from the public sector point of view, Linda, I think because what to work with organ, the larger organisations to embed who are desperately looking for ESG solutions, an awful lot of them say to me, I um, mean, it kind of look over their shoulder and was like, what the hell is ESG and what we meant to do about it? And these are bigger companies. So ESG is definitely something that is worth everybody exploring because there is a piece and a role in there for, for every type of organisation. And it is undoubtedly, from a business point of view, those that are in, the, in commercial organisations will be a material factor. Um, and again, I've got, I've got a client that's in the 
large format print industry. So they do the, the huge great banners by the side of the stage at Glastonbury and places like that. Literally before the pandemic, they threw everything away, went to landfill. They didn't really think about it. Uh, they paid a, a fee to go to landfill and then they can't actually do that now. And they are changing their business strategy around what they do with waste. And there is a great story at the end of it, how it's repurposed and coming out as traffic bollards, interestingly enough. Um, but what they, the, the CEO said to me that what shocked him was that questions about environmental issues were an addendum on tenders pre COVID. And now they're question number two or question number three. And he is actually managing to charge a premium to the customers when he says, well, if you want us to do dispose of this material uh, efficiently and environmentally effectively, you're going to have to pay for it. And they are bit by bit. So the money side of it is, is starting to emerge, but it's, it's one of those things that we'll look back every two years and go, okay, I saw material change, but when you're living in it, you don't really see it that much. And, and I think Martin, you're absolutely right. Uh, ESG is, is the new CSR, arguably with teeth, um, because it's, it's got a lot more power behind it than, than corporate social responsibility, which was, as is ESG to an extent, um, voluntary, but is actually ESG is going to have a much bigger impact. So, so that's the kind of a, I hope that wasn't too much of a lecture. I didn't mean it to be that way, but ESG is definitely worth looking at from that point, from, from all your business point of view. Um, what was, so, so Dawn, you, what you wanted to talk, uh, one of the things that you said was about, um, baseline measurement and the discussion could you could you just share a little bit of your thoughts what what you how you want to steer that and what you want to come out of that yes it's um going back to the old idea of um if you don't know what you're starting with you can't measure anything and so it is getting this baseline probably as the one of the easiest ways to get a baseline is looking at the financial side of things so looking at a profit and loss um account um, of expenditure Again, we've had the pandemic gone through. It has made us move in all sorts of ways. It has shown what could be possible in ways of working, for example, that we never thought would happen. And it has created that watershed. And you alluded to that earlier on by saying, you know, how were we post -pand pre pandemic? <clears throat> and we have changed very much. That is a good way of looking back, I think, to provide a base for many things in life, um, but equally for this and taking us forward. Um, and going back again to what I was saying at the beginning is we are likely to get far more traction with this, far more commitment if we can put financial side on it as well as just the social side on this. There has to be a business reason for moving forward, be it um, because of comp competition out there or so on. So if we can get some form of base measurement and it starts as simple as how many reams of paper did you use in one year as opposed to this year? But it goes on from that. It's having every single time um, something there that says, this is where we are now. And I'm not even saying at this point, where do we want to get to, but just knowing where we are now, how are items measured um, for everything within an organization it, eventually, but taking it again, small, depending on the size of organization of do we know what we spent on X? What would it cost us to move to another supplier purchaser? What if we start to bring in some green um, influence on that? Um, and I'd like to open that out to others to say, well, how are you planning or what are you already doing on getting a measurement? And how can the uh, accounts departments be involved in that? If that is the correct department even, but how can we measure where we are? We certainly can't change it if you can't measure it. So, um, and, and the, the, the bean counters are always the important people who will uh, say, yeah, I'm hearing these things, I guess, won't they? So, um, yeah, follow, follow on from, who, who wants to kick off with some thoughts and share some thoughts on that, that whole baseline measurement stuff? Is, is it, one of those things do you find for it's almost just too daunting and you don't know where to begin i mean rachel from sorry to pick on you from that point of view but as you as you've said that you're at the leverage at the very very beginning is it one of those things that you just look at it from a, it, is it too daunting or is it just time or or what i think a bit of both um you know we're a small office 
and I, you know, in some respects, I look around and think, oh, we're okay. Um, but no, like in any walk of life, there is always room for improvement, isn't there? So I've scribbled down a few ideas, but it's um, like how much, how much time do you devote to it? And yeah, where do you start with, you know, things that people have said, I would never have really thought of, our, of the supply chain um, until today. So I guess that's an easy place to start and then work from there. Yeah, and if if I may, um, Dawn, just dive in on that on that supply chain thing. I think because it's, it's been raised a couple of times, um, and again, without getting too technical and without referencing this to two big organisations, but the, the um, again, hands up if you, you the concept of scope one, two, and three is anything to anybody. To, if those things are familiar to you, um, so scope one, two, and three. I mean. Scopes are part of the United Nations goals, basically, and it's all about um, measurement of um, energy consumption directly and indirectly in an organisation. So large corporate businesses are being tasked with um, reducing their greenhouse gas emissions through the scope one and scope two schedules. The thing that terrifies them is scope three. And scope three is that they are increasingly becoming responsible for this, the uh, emissions of their supply chain and their customers and this goes back to where i think it's going to have an impact on businesses the to, to so one of the businesses that supports the environmental business network is, is kia the construction business they've got eight and a half thousand suppliers and they are increasingly becoming responsible for the behaviors of, of those eight and a half thousand organizations so large businesses are looking at supply chain. We'll start to get to look at supply chain and that will increase massively over the next three to five years. So there is, so um, Rachel, to an extent, your scope one emissions, i.e. the energy consumption um, that, that goes on in Leverett's is a big customer scope three issues, if you see what I mean. So your, your direct emissions is somebody else's problem. So at some stage, they will start, organizations will start saying to people, in the supply chain, what are you doing about it? So there's an element that if you're having no choice on it, really, to an extent, to remain competitive. But it's interesting to look at your own supply chain. I think that is a really good place to start, actually, because everybody buys something. And, and I would imagine, um, uh, from the school's point of view, and certainly from um, uh, Linda's point of view, that the spend of, of schools and the councils is quite significant. Um, so, so Anne and, and Andy, have you done anything on your own supply chain? No, I can I can just say that we are starting to look at that. Obviously, we do a lot of construction and a lot of contractor work, and that's that's my area, and that is it, that is starting to be part of that. We're just changing. We're looking at changing our energy supplier and making sure that we you know that we go for green energy, um, which isn't always the most cost effective option. Not yet. I think possibly it will be, but it's not at the moment. Um, and also just to, just to hop back to the, the, the point you made earlier about baseline, we, we are dreadful at using paper. Schools are just dreadful, complete. We, you weigh too much. And I'm sadly, my department is a little bit last century about that. But we are using paper cut as part of our a software within to say, well, this is what we're using this year. Let's remeasure it in, in 12 months time. So there's quite a lot of little stuff that we're doing. Um, the supply chain is bigger and that is a massive thing moving forward because there's the, the cost implication, but I think that will come. So I agree with you that supply wise, there's lots we can do, but there's also lots of other things we can do as we, as we kind of go forward in everything that we look at, we can say, hang on, are we looking at the sustainability aspect of that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Linda and Andy, I can see hands. Are, are they recent hands or old hands? As in you want to say something. Linda, were you, you going to comment or not? Well, sorry, I, I lost you a little bit there. Um, yeah, just yeah, I'm just saying, I can, I can see a hand on your screen. I wasn't sure whether it was reference to the previous yeah. one or whether it's a new hand that you were say. You. Just say, as an organisation, as a council, you know, we trawl through, and I've got my chairman of finance here, so I need to care, trawl through every, um, you know, expenditure code to the penny. So it's then quite easy to review year on year you know, where savings are being made either in paper or if we turn to electric uh, vehicles in fuel and different things like that. So small and large, 
definitely the supply chain we are very hot and have been for a couple of years about our suppliers and and um and their green credentials the the other side of the organization is sort of inwards is what we're doing and then outwards is about the social influence so trying to persuade people more people to use a bus more people to use train through the community rail partnership and different things like that walk more walking and and that might be putting improve signage or whatever it is that needed to do it so we're sort of a, a dual operation one is looking about what we are doing ourselves and how we're improving our own green credentials and then the second is about social influence yeah absolutely yeah it's a good way of looking at it from that point of view um <clears throat> anybody else got any thoughts on on that that the, the concept of baseline and where to start i, I noticed um uh, martin put something in the chat there he's quite right there are lots of really good free tools out there arguably too many sometimes i think is one of the challenges i think people face is that where do you actually start there are so many organizations but but there are some some great tools and i'd suggest maybe martin people should pick up with you if they want some guidance and steering on 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 that that point um okay just just conscious of um, how, how are we doing for time dawn are we okay sorry you're muted <laughs> Sorry, I think someone would get past that stage by now, wouldn't you, really? Um, we haven't got an end time on this, but uh, we've just moved over our hour now a little, um, so possibly we should be thinking about moving into Q&A session now. If anyone has anything else they wish to uh, raise at this point. Okay, let, let, let me throw a couple just to get this, this going, maybe, if I may. The first, the first thing... Um, I think is worth you all looking at is is the marketing and promotion of what you're doing. Um, I think there's some really really good stuff come out of this meeting, and I think that the the the, the, the one positive takeaway I'd like everybody to have here is that if you're doing the very fact that you're on this call is is good, but you're doing little things. There are six million SMEs in this country, and if they all did one thing, that is bigger than anything that the corporate organisations could do um, collectively. So a million actions across six million or six million actions across the business community makes a hell of a difference. So first thing is don't despair about it and, and just keep going with that. Second is really about marketing and promotion. There, there is the, a very fine line to walk between greenwashing, um, i.e. bullshitting about what you're doing, basically. But also the other side of that coin is not to say nothing. And I think... Um, and I'm just picking up stuff that, that you said, for example, I think what, what Seven Oaks School are doing is fantastic. And, and your challenge to an extent partly there is to integrate that into your wider communication strategy without looking like you're overblowing your trumpet, but you can actually share with other schools the learnings that you've been through. Um, and certainly, Linda, the stuff that the council's doing, I think you should be very proud of. And it's about how do we get that messaging out there to the marketplace? So I think have a little think about how you promote what you're doing get the tone right because you don't want anybody to come you don't want a journalist to come and attack you basically for saying these guys are over egging the pudding but you certainly should be talking as much as possible and everybody here should be talking up the importance of this being an interaction between um, public private and um, consumers which Tony going back to your point is that if you if in a way you represent the people to an extent or you've got a voice for the people So, so have, a, have a little think about marketing and promotion as well and, and how you get your message across there. Um, and, and the other thing is basically then is just to keep doing what you're doing. I, I'd like to ask a question and I would like some answers on this, please, if possible, rather than just um, uh, somebody looking at other people on muted silences. What, what, where do you want this group and this forum to, to go? What, what, are the, what are the outcomes that are going to be genuinely beneficial to you because i think linda i'm very conscious of one of the things you said is is about the talk and we can all sit on forums like this as long as all day every day but if, if things don't move forward and there's nothing measurable and tangible that comes out of it then it's a little pointless from that point of view so any concretes that you want to come out of, the, of what the chamber are doing from the sustainability group so um quick quick little brainstorm some fire some some uh, thoughts up me please 
I, I think uh, Tony's idea is really um, good. Is that if if sorry, Dawn, um, if the chamber could do maybe a case study once a month of of what people are doing, you know, small and large businesses, I think that would be quite useful. Or and also how they connected with others. So it might be, you know, to give some base to this that they they learned about the grant from the being involved in the forum or they. Um, heard from another business or something so it sort of generates more interest that's something the chamber can definitely take on um, so it would be a case of uh, individuals coming to the chamber and saying we have something to say and then we can promote it out we'd love to great idea thank you Tony, you had your hand up yeah, I think I think from the point of view of the climate action network just if I'm not speaking as a councillor just as a citizen who cares about this stuff um, showing how business and its customers in the community work together and you know, how how people use what business has got to offer would be a really good way of, of making the whole community um, and local businesses you know, be seen as leaders really and actually make <laughs> so show that seven oaks is, at, is actually seven oaks as a community people and business is is making a difference that, that yeah we, very good make that happen and be great yeah um Anne? um i would just add that I, I really like the idea of case studies and as i think i mentioned at the beginning we're looking at one very old building and one sort of slightly newer building which we're going to look at and see what can we do what can't we do and i think from that i'd be happy to share the results of that and from that some support in some of the challenges regarding listed buildings or whatever i think and that could be helpful to others as well brilliant yeah, I think because you, you, you're not, I mean, obviously you you have got a, a number of 80 odd buildings, you say, but you're not alone in that, that challenge of being in an older building. And, and as, as, as Dawn said earlier, the, the challenge then between landlord and tenant and whose responsibility is, is an interesting area, I think, as well, is that people say, oh, well, I can't influence the energy consumption in our building because we're only tenants. And again, that's an area that needs to be debated. So, yeah, really good stuff. What, what else would people like out of this? I think for me, it's about um, keeping it practical. Um, a, an example of that, I was um, horrified by the amount of plastic waste and, and just sort of general waste that all goes into one bin at my golf club. Um, and so I was able to kind of put the golf club in touch with Lowcase, which is the grant funding program that the council run um european money to basically get some recycling bins installed on the tees at my golf club i play at um, north Foreland in broadstairs so now we have segregated waste Very so in, in, instead of just you know all our plastic and everything going into landfill we can now segregate that plastic and we can recycle it so it's just very very practical very simple thing to do that the the club were able to implement with the help of some grant funding and for me you know, this is a really big thing for, for businesses to get their heads around. And Andrew alluded to that earlier. And I think the more kind of the more practical, the more kind of step by step approach we can we can adopt, the more people will actually implement change in, in their business. Yeah, if I can just pick up on that, it's sort of going in a slightly different direction. But for me, for me, uh, this is a, a lot. To, I mean, fundamentally, it's a learning curve. Uh, and it's also going forward a sort of sharing of knowledge. Uh, Martin's already given me, you know, a great tip today for which thank you very much uh, in the chat. And and to use that information and knowledge to take it back to my business to say, okay, this is available. This is what we should be doing, and to keep reinforcing the message. You know, but, uh, hopefully as we go forward. And just one other quick comment, uh, just on something we talked about a little while ago about you know, uh, where's the baseline and where do we start and, and how do we measure? Um, I almost, for me, feel that, yeah, I mean, that's absolutely right. I don't disagree with any of that. But there is also an element here where if you're talking about trying to do this within a business, as, as I am, um, actually, I think the start point is to get, to, uh, I don't necessarily like the, the word, but two or three champions in different parts of the, 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 build, uh, the buildings and the teams 
to be right these guys and girls are going to be the ones who are really going to push this because unless you have people pushing it and reinforcing the message and picking up on people who you know in a minor way do put the plastic bottle in the in the normal trash rather than in the recycling then you're never going to get this off the ground or you're never going to succeed put it that way and so you can't get it off the ground yeah agreed absolutely it certainly is a journey that everybody's got or as many people as possible are going to go on one lone voice in the wilderness in an organization is doomed to failure i think good okay but well, one thing i'd like to throw in just as a, an, another area as well as esg is something to look at is is to to encourage you all to explore the circular economy um and and because that is something that everybody can get involved in and potentially what what might be nice dawn is next time when you do these things is people to bring examples of where they've impacted on circularity uh, and um just to emphasize the importance of the circular economy um there's an organization in london re london that is um um funded by the, the mayor of london and the 32 33 london boroughs and that they're, they're, they're a think tank effectively in a consultancy their goal is to make london the most circular city in the world by 2030 and they estimate economically that will bring a, an, a, an additional GVA to London of two and a half to three billion pounds and create 25,000 highly paid jobs. So circularity is not just, a, as people think, it's a tree hugging thing. It's a kind of, um, there, there, it's a growing part of the economy. And it really is something that everybody on this call can get involved in. So uh, Rachel, for example, Leverett's have got business cards that are on um, recycled paper those tiny little things are important, but they can make a big, big difference. And the for, for a quick summary of circularity is the, the linear economy, the old economy is to take, make and waste. And the circular economy is to take, uh, make, reuse and recycle and particularly reuse rather than even recycle. So as, as organisations strive to get to make sure that there is an inbuilt reusability in products, People are looking at what we can do from a recycling point of view and how we can do that again. And, and I've got a, a client, there's a law firm in London who um, are moving or were moving. I can't remember the don't now, but um, in conversation, one of the, the um, subjects we talked about was the consultant that was going to move them was suggesting they needed completely new furniture to fit in with the, the ambience of their new building. And therefore, they should just get rid of all of the old desks and everything that they had there. And we debated it with a managing partner. And I said to him, basically, that's a load of crap. You know, you, you don't need to do that. Not, it's going to cost you a lot of money, but you also don't need to do it. As we were sitting around this huge boardroom table that had gone with them on their journey from when there was just six of them through to a, a 20 partner firm and many, many more people. And that table, he said, this table's seen the story of our business. And the consultant was advocating getting rid of it. And we just looked into what that would have cost, where it would have gone, what had happened to it. I said to him, where do you think it would go? And he hadn't got a clue, never thought about it. And the problem is that somewhere down the line, it would have ended up in landfill or incineration, increasing greenhouse gas. And even just so we just took that table as a metaphor because it told the story of this, this organization. It was a marketing story in the, what the table had seen over the years, but they didn't throw it away. They insisted on it going with them. And those small measures, our circular economy in action so it would be interesting just to for people to think about circularity as they go as you go along and maybe next time we come to this we can encourage more people to come to this forum but also just to share a story of circularity because that makes a massive difference from a from a pollution and landfill and therefore greenhouse gas point of view as well so maybe that's some an area that people could just reflect on That's interesting. Catherine's just returned. She was running a meeting somewhere else. She ran out of battery, apparently. Um, <laughs> there's circularity going on there, you see, in our house. Um, OK, um, Dawn, anything that you, you want to conclude with or are you happy with that at the moment? We've achieved a huge amount in this uh, hour and a half. Um, it's been fascinating hearing stories uh, from other individuals. Um, some widely different and some so similar along the same path that we're all going to be moving and the um the willingness to share information here is exactly what i hoped we would get from this type of forum 
that we all have something to be able to give to others from our own experiences along this way. And the idea of bringing a community together on this, the business, the local communities is another fantastic way that I think this is, we can push this forward um, by just continuing to meet and to develop these ideas along the way. And it's not, as you said at the beginning, this is a walk, it is not a run along the way. This is going to take time. It needs to be embedded in all our areas of life, uh, business, social, and so on. Um, and it's running that green thread through everything we do um, that will start to get us there. And that we're all on such very different levels of uh, the journey is again, assisting everybody throughout that, that we have again, the stories. So again, going back to the idea of podcasts, um, the chamber would be very happy to help um, distribute those. If you have something already, please send them on to us. We'll be able to put them up onto the website uh, and again, get that message out. So thank you very much to everyone for your contributions today. Um, it's been enormously useful, certainly to me personally, and I hope to each other and just looking at faces around uh, what you've all been taking up from this, I think has been fantastic. So uh, Roger, thank you very much for chairing this today. Pleasure. You've done a great job on it. And thank you all for contributing. We will be looking for a, another meeting in three months time and I'll send a date out very shortly and I hope to be able to see you there and with your latest stories along the way. So thank you. Thanks everybody. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Bye.